Superheroes work so hard for us, defeating invading aliens, looking good in Lycra, they deserve great video games that do justice to their magnificence. What greater crime is there, then, than a video game that horribly betrays its central hero? Miring a super-powered badass in clunky controls, horrible graphics, or this whole deal? The Thing! It's clobberin' time! We're here today to seek justice for these wronged metahumans, except for Superman, because his terrible game is so famous already, and frankly, that dude can take care of himself. <laughs> There will be spoilers for the following games, but don't worry too much about it, you won't want to play them anyway. Catwoman has had plenty of great cameos in recent games, from clobbering people in the Injustice fighting series with her martial arts skills, to collecting trophies for the Riddler in Batman Arkham City with her gymnastic skills. A travesty then, that when Catwoman got her own game back in 2004, it was the Catwoman movie tie-in game, in which the primary mode of traversal is scrabbling around on all fours, looking like if the girl from The Ring had decided to become a dominatrix. My whiskers are twitching. What's that? The movie itself received overwhelmingly bad reviews because it was bad, and the hastily made tie-in game, which loosely followed the same story, didn't do much better. This universe's Selina Kyle has cat-like abilities because she's died and been brought back to life by a Mao cat, aka a messenger of the Egyptian goddess Bast, and if you think that diversion from the comics is a bad omen, you'd be right. She was reborn. <laughs> As cat Instead of the cool anti-hero who got her name from being a cat burglar who wore cat suits, the game ends up with a creepily crawling catwoman in leather bootcut trousers and a bra who sounds like she's been possessed by an even snootier Garfield. Tear gas and crying is just so unprofessional. No word on if she likes lasagna though. The game is an action platformer, but it has clunky controls and an awkward camera, two of the things you really don't want when playing a game that requires any kind of precision. Although Selina can really kick butt in the Arkham games, flipping around effortlessly with her whip and knocking every guy unconscious with a satisfying boom, when you fight bad guys in Catwoman, it's mostly just clumsily wailing on them until Selina finally knocks them into a convenient dumpster. Mercifully, this game can be finished in less than three hours, which is sadly still longer than the Catwoman DLC for Batman Arkham City, which, by contrast, didn't do Selina dirty and didn't have a running animation so creepy that I still see it when I close my eyes at night. Ugh. Today, when you think of Aquaman, you most likely think of Jason Momoa's portrayal of the Atlantean ruler, as one of the few Justice League members likely to crack a smile, and the only one who is mates with a drumming octopus. Aquaman is a fun superhero, in other words, which is why it's such a shame that this fish-gabbing, trident-wielding Underwater King's only video game to date is absolutely no fun at all, unless you are particularly fond of seeing Aquaman get punched in the head by a crab person over and over. Released in 2003 for the GameCube and Xbox, Aquaman Battle for Atlantis tells the story of Aquaman fighting to save his kingdom from the renewed threat of mortal enemy Black Manta. Which sounds exciting until five seconds in when you realise it's going to be telling that story in cutscenes that are neither animated nor voiced. And if you think that sounds like it's going to be funny, guess what? It's just boring. Told you. The game's lo-fi presentation wouldn't have been such an issue if actually playing Battle for Atlantis was any better. 
but sadly it really wasn't, reducing Aquaman's entire existence to following an arrow through an eerily empty city of Atlantis. That is, until you came across some enemies to slowly kick and punch, while the camera tried to make up its mind what it was you should be looking at. This pattern of swimming, punching, and swimming some more repeated and repeated, quickly getting very dull, and never capitalising on its hero's kingly status and nautical powers, instead making you feel more like an underwater nightclub bouncer turning away a never-ending queue of pissed-up crab men. These same missions were occasionally livened up with the odd submarine outing or spending a token to summon a friendly sea creature to help out in a fight, but even commanding a dolphin to slam into the groin of your enemies quickly got boring. When doing that quickly gets boring, your game is in serious trouble. Asgard, proud and gleaming jewel of the nine worlds. The Asgardians have, since the Allfather opened his wizened eye, stood defiant against the wrath of their many enemies. But wrath is a sword easily shattered, and these foes have thus far been unsuccessful. Perhaps they need a better plan. Before he was given the limelight in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Thor was one of the many overlooked comic book heroes Marvel just couldn't sell the movie rights to. Then Chris Hemsworth rocked up with a beard, long hair and a big hammer and Thor was hot stuff again. For some reason. But Thor wasn't just given his own film, as back in 2011 companies were still trying to regularly make rush release tie-in games, which, for anyone fortunate enough to never have played one, were usually bad. Sadly, Thor God of Thunder for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 doesn't buck that trend. It makes you want to smash it on the floor and shout ANOTHER, just like Thor himself, except when you shout ANOTHER, it's because you're asking for another Thor game that isn't this one. Because it's bad. Victory or Valhalla! Set before the events of the film, this game has Loki secretly working with the Frost Giants to take down Asgard, a twist revealed in the trailer for the game. You require an answer, Loki. And my answer is yes. I will help you to defeat Asgard. You play as an unflatteringly rendered Chris Hemsworth, travelling between the realms of the World Tree in order to smash things with Mjolnir and shoot lightning at stuff. That sounds like an entertaining premise, but to quote the people who saw the botched beheading of Mary Queen of Scots, the execution could have been better. Reviewers and fans alike panned the game. The controls are laggy, the game is glitchy, and smashing things with Mjolnir is not as fun as it should be. To quote Eurogamer's review at the time, Thor himself looks and moves like a stop-motion movie made with action figures. Even though that action figure model allegedly had Chris Hemsworth's face, none of his fun portrayal of the God of Thunder comes through at all. To quote Eurogamer again, he sounds like he's being forced to read his lines at gunpoint. Sif? She has recovered? It's a funny story, really. You see... And in time, you will tell its brother. Now I must join my fellow warriors at the observatory. Come on, developers at Liquid Entertainment. You had Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston in the studio, and this is the best you got! Still, at least Thor fans eventually did get to play a great game that really made the most of a hard-hitting weapon you could throw and call back like the world's deadliest boomerang. God of War. Don't worry, I'm not forgetting the other good game Thor was actually in. Lego Marvel Super Heroes. The superhero spawn, like choker necklaces and Tamagotchis, was a big deal in the 90s. Unlike those things, however, this murdered assassin, real name Al Simmons, made a deal with a demon that gave him otherworldly powers and enabled him to escape hell. Although, now we think about it, that would also be a plausible origin story for Tamagotchis. Oh, are you hungry? Oh, no, 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 by all means. The brainchild of comic writer Todd McFarlane, Spawn had a huge impact on the comic book world, selling in massive numbers despite not coming from the powerhouses of DC or Marvel, and both 
boasting a distinctive, intricate, super dramatic art style that filled every inch of the page with cape and any space left over with chains. But while Spawn upset the comic scene in the 90s, this gritty anti-hero's video game outings in that era were upsetting only in the normal sense, because boy they were not good. And the worst of all was 1997's Spawn the Eternal for the PlayStation 1, or as we called it back then, the PlayStation. <laughs> In this game you controlled, and we use that word so loosely, Spawn as he navigated 3D levels looking for power-ups hidden in bins, or walls that could be smashed through. It didn't look or sound great, but the primary issue was that the game used what are known in gaming parlance as tank controls, which means tilting the stick left and right spun Spawn around on the spot like he was taped to a Lazy Susan. So even just steering a character who, remember, is supposed to be an acrobatic combat demon onto one of those bin power-ups was a massive chore. More baffling still, when an enemy was encountered, the camera would swing around to the right, turning Spawn the Eternal into a 2D fighting game. And not an enjoyable one, with Spawn's coolest powers hidden behind intricate input patterns that were tricky to pull off, meaning you could tear a man's arm off and beat him to death with it, but not really be sure how you did it or how to do it again. The game's awfulness is all the more frustrating because it did have some intriguing ideas, like the Necroplasm counter, which, like in the comics, starts at 9999 and counts down when Spawn uses his powers, for instance to heal after a fight get to zero and it's game over, so you had to make it through the game with only the necroplasm on hand. Which, who knows, could have been interesting if making it through the first 10 minutes of this frustrating brawler without ejecting and snapping the disc didn't already feel like enough of a challenge. Oh man, I could really rip someone's arms off right now. Okay, half circle, front to back, plus X. <laughs> That's enough Spawn the Eternal for today. Forever, actually. In America, much like Thor, was another Marvel hero who was overlooked for decades and then suddenly adored by millions when he was portrayed on screen by an incredibly charismatic and handsome actor. Hmm, I'm sensing a theme here. That's it, they're both named Chris. Also like Thor, Steve Rogers got a mediocre tie-in movie game for his first Marvel Cinematic Universe film, but believe it or not, this was not the first subpar adventure he'd been on. Back in 1987, Captain America appeared in his first ever video game, which was called, deep breath, Captain America in the Doom Tube of Dr. Megaloman, a title as weird as it is hard to remember. In Captain America in the Boob Tube of Dr. Megalodon, Captain America must stop an evil doctor from launching rockets full of a deadly virus and presumably trapping everyone inside March 2020 for all eternity. To disable these missiles, Cap has to go to the Doom Tube, a base in the Mojave Desert filled with the deadly virus, forcing him to fight through enemies to build up his immunity. Yeah, I'm no immunologist, but I don't remember Dr. Fauci telling us to beat up whatever the hell these things are supposed to be. Not only was its understanding of virology suspect, but it just wasn't a good game, universally panned by critics and players alike. Between the difficult and repetitive fights, you had to stop to do boring password solving puzzles, and on top of that, you had to finish it within an hour or you failed. Yay! Captain America wasn't even given a real Marvel villain to fight. Dr. Megloman was made up for the game and has only ever been mentioned once since in the Marvel Universe, namely in the now defunct social network game Marvel Avengers Alliance when S.H.I.E.L.D. operative Agent Coulson identifies his already dead body. What a triumphant return. But worst of all, Cap had more than one of his iconic vibranium shield which he could lose if he threw too many and didn't pick them back up. Yeah, that's definitely not canon. Also, it came on lots of different platforms with varying quality and graphics. Still, those playing on the Atari ST, Amstrad CPC and the Commodore 64 could at least be happy knowing that their versions of Captain America in the rude lube of Dr. Mega Man at least had Cap in the right costume, unlike the ZX Spectrum version in which Cap was totally see-through like some knockoff version of the Invisible Man. Still, I guess that's what you get when the art is done by, quote, an artist friend. Maybe credit them by name and they'll actually colour him in next time. Get ready! Flame on! It's clobbering time! 
In the 90s, the side-scrolling beat-em-up was one of the most popular video game genres around, and while these games came in all shapes and sizes, one thing you could usually count on was a roster of four playable characters, each with their own unique playstyles and abilities. In other words, 1997's Fantastic Four game for the PlayStation should have been a slam dunk, but sadly this truly terrible brawler was more like going for a slam dunk, but the ball bounces off the rim and hits you in the face, sending you into a coma where your subconscious tortures you by playing Mr. Fantastic's weirdly sax-heavy intro cinematic over and over. Mr. Fantastic! The premise was very sound. You take control of one of the Fantastic Four using the stretching powers of Mr. Fantastic, the force fields of the Invisible Woman, the fiery devastation of the Human Torch, or the crusty bigness of the Thing. And also, She-Hulk is there for some reason. So that's five playable characters then in the Fantastic Four game. Off to a good start. Things got worse when you started playing, however, with sluggish controls making each and every one of those superheroes feel super unexciting to play as, even when deploying their special abilities, which didn't wreak nearly as much destruction as you wanted them to. All too often, attacks would fail to land because you hadn't shuffled onto exactly the same plane as your enemies, and encounters were incredibly repetitive. making the Fantastic Four's first video game one of the least enjoyable brawlers ever, notable only for its badness and for having the most unsettling block move in fighting game history. It's hard to imagine any superhero squad more suited to a side-scrolling beat-em-up, which is why it's such a shame that playing as Mr. Fantastic, the Invisible Woman, Human Torch and The Thing is such an underwhelming time. <laughs> Alright, it's decided. The Fantastic Four suck. She-Hulk, you're up! Why are you here again, She-Hulk? Daredevil is a unique Marvel hero in its roster of characters. Left blind by an accident involving radioactive materials as a child, Matt Murdock's remaining four senses became superhuman, allowing him not only to become a master at martial arts, but also an attorney at law. I mean, passing the bar is about throwing a baton really hard into people's faces, right? He's been the subject of some great adaptations, and when we say some, we mean one. The Netflix one. Because dear lord that film. I mean, how did Ben Affleck get the Batman gig after this seesaw scene? Seriously? It's so bad! I mean, Matt Murdock would be way more careful about not revealing his abilities in his civilian garb, and none of these kids would keep it quiet, and I can't believe that I'm <clears throat> anyway, alongside the release of the 2003 film came, you guessed it, yet another tie-in video game, made for the Game Boy Advance. Daredevil has appeared in plenty of Marvel games, mostly fighting ones, but with Daredevil's distinctive abilities, you may have expected some kind of distinctive gameplay in his own game, something that fits his sleuthy approach to fighting crime. Just imagine stealthy Mark of the Ninja-style action sequences at night where you gather clues, using Daredevil's radar sense to puzzle your way around Hell's Kitchen. Then during the day, you could have Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney-style court sequences, where you present the evidence you found, perhaps using Daredevil's hearing to listen to a character's heartbeat and work out if they're lying or not. Which is why they made the Daredevil game a 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up platformer. Lots of critics expressed disappointment in how it didn't make the most of Daredevil himself, with GameSpot noting, Daredevil is an exciting, explosive character, and that energy doesn't manifest itself in this game. The gameplay is just button mashing until enemies fall over, fiddly platforming, and using Daredevil's iconic radar sense to find collectibles and power-ups. Yay! And it definitely doesn't have the cool grittiness of the Devil of Hell's Kitchen. Instead, it has cartoony sound effects popping out when you punch folks like POW or WAP, which, I'll be honest, hits different in a postcard DB world. Plus, when you finish the game, your only reward is a slideshow of screenshots from the movie, which, as we already know, was bad. Specifically, 
likely these were the problems with it. First off, the eyes on Daredevil's mask were weirdly spaced apart, and to be honest, we would have preferred to see something in the vein of Joe Quesada's cover up from the year spanning 1998. So those were seven superheroes betrayed by their own crappy game. Can you think of any other examples? If so, then why not shout in the comments? And if you enjoyed this, check out some of the other stuff that we do on this channel and over on Outside Xbox as well. It's not just list videos. We also do uh, Let's Plays. We do live streams. Uh, playing through Dark Souls at the moment uh, with Ellen. Just started. That's pretty fun. She's never played it before. So uh, yeah, check that out and, and, and see, see how we get on. Uh, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.